So how can we increase our exit velocity? We have the continuity equation. It's safe to say we have a supported hypothesis. A performance improvement of 25.7%. But these properties, which we'll discuss next time, are much better described in a qualitative way. All right, so now we're out of that sticky situation. Speaking of sticky, onto the last key concept, the adhesive-cohesive balance. For those who are unaware, cohesion is a property of identical molecules that stick together very well, like with water or mercury. But adhesion is a tendency of dissimilar molecules to stick together. A balance between adhesion and cohesion is basically a fancy way of saying the web must be very strong and very sticky, but also in such a way that fits your individual needs. For instance, some people might want their web shooter to be used for grappling or forming web lines. Thus, adhesion would take a backseat and the cohesion of the web becomes more important. Now, others might want to shoot sticky goo that could trap their enemies. I mean, whatever you want, you know, whatever floats your boat. The supposed ideal here, if we're looking at something fantastical like web swinging, is that the web is both strong so it can support the weight of the user, and sticky so its attachment to any surface can support the weight of the user. However, even if this web line existed, it would adhere to the user's hand when they grab it as well, so they shouldn't plan on letting go of it unless they want to lose some skin. Now, of course, this could be solved by some sort of special glove that doesn't stick to the web line, but, I mean, come on, that's a whole other issue. Luckily, web shooters can be used in more ways than just creating web lines to swing on, and that's where the adhesive-cohesive balance comes in. Me personally, I would like to create webs that can make movement difficult for a target as a sort of non-lethal self-defense weapon. I mean, think of the applications. But, but of course, swinging would be pretty great too. Generally, we can set the adhesiveness of the web line by changing the ingredients. Let's look at the basic web formula that I outlined in one of my videos, consisting of four ingredients. Isopropanol, polymethyl methacrylate, tetrafluoroethane, and polysorbate 80. For now, I'm going to abstract these ingredients as solvent, polymer, propellant, and surfactant, as they each have a very clear role to play. Now, I wanted to show that this formula could create a web line that, when shot, connects the web shooter nozzle to the target. It took a lot of trial and error with the ingredients to achieve this, but the first formula I found that worked was 38% solvent, 6% polymer, 37% propellant, and 19% surfactant. Now, while this did create a web line, it was clear that the line was not very cohesive. It easily broke after sufficient movement. So next, my desire was to increase the cohesion, which likely would sacrifice some adhesion, but hopefully not so much that the web no longer stuck to the wall. I modified my formula to increase the surfactant and decrease the solvent. I didn't want to alter any of the other ingredients as increasing the solid polymer would likely make the fluid too thick and decreasing the liquid propellant would likely do the same. So my next fluid recipe was 28.5% solvent, 6% polymer, 37% propellant, and 28.5% surfactant. I tested this web formula in this video and it was clear the web lines were slightly stronger. Having the same amount of solvent and surfactant seemed to balance adhesion and cohesion. But why is this? Well, a solvent is what makes the web fluid a fluid for the most part. While the propellant also has some absolutely necessary dissolving properties, it must act together with the solvent in order to fully dissolve the polymer. Now, polymers are difficult to dissolve, so finding a solvent for a particular polymer can be tricky. In this case, it just so happens that polymethyl methacrylate will dissolve nicely in isopropanol, and that solution dissolves nicely in tetrafluoroethane, even when the surfactant is added. So having less solvent means that the fluid will be more viscous, and more solvent means less viscous. A less viscous fluid will wet the target surface much more easily, which is an important property of adhesion. Wetting most obviously means that a liquid must be able to maintain contact with the substrate material. Most liquids can do this to most solids, but the opposite to this effect would be something like water interacting with hydrophobic material, where the cohesive forces within the water are much greater than any adhesive force between the water and the substrate. This can also be seen in nature, with water being unable to wet the surface of leaves. And there are more advantages that a less viscous solution can provide. Since none of the independent ingredients have any adhesive properties whatsoever, 
I propose that the main method of adhesion presented here is purely mechanical. That is to say the web fluid works its way into the small pores of the substrate in order to maintain a secure bond. As we've discussed earlier in our oh-so-fun fluid dynamics segment, a more viscous fluid will not be able to flow as easily through small pores. So we see why the solvent might affect the adhesive-cohesive balance, but what about the surfactant? So a surfactant is a surface active agent that is able to lower the surface tension of a substance. Think about soap in water. Now, ordinary water has a high surface tension, as can be seen if you completely fill a container with water. If you add soap, which contains surfactants, the surface tension is lowered and we see the bulge of the water over the top can't reach the same height that it did before. Now, surface tension is the tendency of a liquid surface to shrink to the smallest surface area possible. It's why water beads become circular or spherical in zero gravity. If you try to blow bubbles with pure water, you'll be sorely disappointed. The geometry of a bubble means it contains very little volume, but has a lot of surface area. The surface tension will collapse the bubble into a solid sphere of the same volume, which is going to be very small. On the surface of water, any air bubble which rises to the top will be unstable. The walls are going to rejoin the water to maintain a flat surface, and the air will go back into the atmosphere. However, if you add soap, the surfactants will decrease the surface tension and bubbles will become possible with their large surface areas and small volumes. Now, adding our surfactant to web fluid means the same thing, that bubbles can form. Now, most likely these bubbles mainly contain the expanded propellant gas. This allows our web fluid to expand to greater apparent volumes than it would otherwise appear, one way to potentially store a lot of web in a small container. These bubbles, however, increase the surface area of the web fluid, meaning the solvent can evaporate more quickly, leading to more solid, less adhesive, more cohesive webs. You can think analogously about how long it takes for a large, shallow puddle to evaporate versus a glass of water of the same volume. The puddle will be gone in no time, as the surface area, the area that is exposed to the environment which causes evaporation, and the area at which the vapor molecules must exit, is much larger. So the addition of expansion due to surfactants may cause the solvent to evaporate more quickly and the web to become less adhesive and more cohesive. The addition of excess solvent may cause the web fluid to stay liquid for longer and be able to seep into the pores of the target, becoming more adhesive and less cohesive. If we look at the history of my web fluid tests, we can see a large range of adhesive-cohesive balances, especially when I first started to observe the properties of this sort of mixture. For instance, in this test from my web fluid tutorial in 2017, I added a really small amount of surfactant. And when the web fluid was shot, it maintained its liquid state for a very long time, was extremely sticky, and was able to be shot rather quickly. In these tests, also from 2017, I added a really small amount of solvent with a higher amount of surfactant. Now this web fluid came out with larger expanded diameters, almost instantly solid, not sticky at all, and only oozed out slowly from the nozzle. In the end, it goes back to the two main uses of web shooters. If you want to catch objects in a web, you may want a more adhesive web fluid. If you want to be able to hang on your web line or swing through the city streets like a majestic spider man, then cohesion is your best friend. Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. What are we doing here? Web swinging? Are we serious? Okay, now... This is the not so fun downer ending of the video, but I'm going to try turning it around. So just bear with me. So there's some major problems with the concept of web swinging and we're going to discuss them here. I hear a lot of people say that you'll tear your arm off if you were able to swing like Spider-Man, which, okay, maybe you will, but that's the problem you see with this. Really? I mean, first of all, storage. We talked about expansion due to gas bubbles increasing the apparent volume of the web beyond that of what the container could hold, but that doesn't even begin to cover what we see in fiction. From the Amazing Spider-Man movies, can I first say that I love these movies? We hear an Oscorp promotional video state, Engineered from genetically enhanced spiders, Oscorp's biocable tensile strength is unparalleled. We're just beginning to understand all the potential industrial applications. A single pellet can safely store several hundred meters of a lightweight cable. The pellet they're talking about is that little cartridge that Peter pushes into his tiny watch web shooters. 
In this movie, Peter's webs are actually spider silk, farmed by Oscorp and somehow placed into these small pellets. It's true that spider silk is lightweight in real life, in that its density, 1.097 grams per cubic centimeter, is very small compared to other typical heavy load cable materials like steel or even many synthetic polymers. I mean, furthermore, its tensile strength is stronger than some steels, though not stronger than the strongest steels. The tensile strength of dragline silk from an orb weaving spider is around 1 gigapascal, essentially saying it can hold around 1 billion newtons if it had a cross sectional area of 1 square meter, or 1,000 newtons if it had a cross sectional area of 1 square millimeter. For reference to my fellow Americans, 1,000 newtons is about 225 pounds of force. It's a lot. So let's analyze for the bare minimum required storage space. Now let's say Pete weighs about the same as me, about 170 pounds. Yeah, I'm in shape. It makes sense, this is Andrew Garfield's Peter Parker. He's tall and skinny, just like me. A load of 170 pounds of force means that the minimum required cross-sectional area here would be about 0.756 square millimeters. Okay, just ignore that I'm mixing units here. Oscorp clearly runs on metric, so blame them. Now let's look at storing even just 100 meters, not the several hundred Oscorp claims to be possible. Let's look at 100,000 millimeters of rope with a cross-sectional area of 0.756 square millimeters. Now this rope has a volume of 75.6 thousand cubic millimeters, or 75.6 thousand microliters, or 75.6 milliliters. That's not a lot, it's about a third of a cup, but it's still more than the teaspoon size of cartridge we see Peter use in the movie. Okay, so maybe it's feasible, but remember we took the bare minimum here in terms of load for the rope, and that will never ever cut it. In engineering there's something called a safety factor. Usually for holding people we want the rope to be rated for a load of 10 times what we need, because there's no room for error when it comes to human life. Which means we need 10 times the cross-sectional area of the rope, i.e. 10 times the volume. But furthermore, not to burst anyone's bubble, but Spider silk is not stronger than Kevlar. It's not. I'm sorry. At least, not in the tensile sense. It's true that the energy required to break spider silk at 400 kilojoules per kilogram is much higher than Kevlar's 30 kilojoules per kilogram. But this is a measure of toughness, of energy absorption, important for the engineering of stuff like bulletproof vests, not for hanging a static load on a tensile cable. While that is very impressive and mostly due to the amazing elasticity of spider silk, Kevlar's tensile strength is four times as high as spider silk's at four gigapascals. So we know that Kevlar is four times as strong as spider silk for our application. And take a look at this real demonstrable test of Kevlar. It's important to note here that I weigh about 170 pounds, and this rope is rated for 500 pounds. So yeah! Now the rope broke at the knot, so there's likely a concentration of stress there, but still. If you can't tie a rope around something without it breaking, I'd say that means it can't actually support the load. Now the diameter of this Kevlar line is 1.4 millimeters, meaning the cross-sectional area is about 1.53 square millimeters, so it stands to reason that the smaller area of 0.756 square millimeters for the weaker spider silk wouldn't come close. Now this Kevlar line rated for 2,000 pounds and having a diameter of 3.1 millimeters, so a cross-sectional area of about 7.55 square millimeters, can hold my weight quite securely. Now this safety factor is in theory 2,000 divided by 170, or about 11.8. To get this same safety factor for spider silk, you need to multiply the cross-sectional area of the Kevlar line by 4, or multiply the diameter by 2 to get 6.2 millimeters. Now, I'm not the best at eyeballing distances, but I'd say that could be larger than the web lines we see in The Amazing Spider-Man, depending on the scene. To estimate how much web fluid we'd need to store for 100 meters of this theoretical spider line, we can run the same process as before. The diameter is 6.2 millimeters, so the cross-sectional area is about 30.19 square millimeters. 
So 100 meters or 100,000 millimeters of this line would have a volume of around 3.019 liters, which is probably way too big to hold on your wrist, let alone anywhere else. Apart from the unrealistic volume storage, we see that there's another major problem that will need serious scientific advancements to solve. We've discussed the idea that an ideal web would be both very cohesive and very adhesive. So the end of the line could stick to a building and the line itself could hold the load. And we've already discussed that the web would not be able to discriminate between the user's hand and the building when creating an extremely strong bond. But one of the most glaring issues with this is that this type of bond doesn't really exist. Alan Pan from the channel Sufficiently Advanced did a great job demonstrating that even some of the strongest adhesives available cyanoacrylates are not strong enough to hold a person's weight when attached at the end of a rope. This led him to go straight to the grappling hook route, which I'd say is a wise move. Compounding this problem with all of the dirt and dust and condensation that surely covers the exterior of the New York City skyline makes it look really unlikely that a web line could hold even a moderate load to the side of a building. Now, of course, I want to urge people to never say never. Current web shooter theories can't solve this problem, but maybe future ones can. For instance, we could somehow use real spider silk, and I want to stress the somehow here because nobody, no spider, nothing has ever shot spider silk in the way Spider-Man does. Silk is simply excreted or dispensed at slower velocities in nature. But anyway, spiders have different types of silk. Some are for attaching web lines at their ends and are really sticky, and some are for making really strong strands. So they have solved this problem. Or should I say the evolution of silk spinners has really given them some impressive skills. So if we could somehow achieve the incredible adhesion and strength of spider silk, we may have a shot. But these are some pretty big ifs. Now I won't go too much into real spider silk as I definitely have a plan to cover that super fascinating topic another day. And then, you know, there's the arm tear off thing, but as an athlete, that never really concerned me, but I suppose it could happen. So yeah, web swinging probably won't be with fluid shooters anytime soon, which means these guys have the right idea. Now, I'm going to take a crack at something like this too. I just have to find a way to make it my own so we can really start to advance this thing. I mean, the idea of grappling hooks being easily retractable so you could swing and get your rope back while you're shooting the next line seems really exciting, but there's a lot of technical problems that need to be solved there. Grappling, believe it or not, at the end of these incredibly long videos is a topic for another day. But just look at the topics we covered here. I mean, phase transitions, polymers, projectile motion, fluid dynamics, simulations, tensile strength, intermolecular forces, and that's just scratching the surface. In practice, making web shooters may involve solid mechanics, electronics, or even programming. I'd say setting out to make web shooters is a great way to learn all things science and engineering. And parents, if you're watching, I hope you can excuse some of my language, but if you want to get your kids started in STEM, maybe don't think your kids are crazy if they say they want to be Spider-Man. I hope you all enjoyed watching and I hope you learned something. I'm continually fascinated by the topics I've covered here, as you can probably tell. I would consider this video to be a must watch for those who want to make web shooters. I mean, I, I can't think of a topic I didn't cover. If you have any gripes with any of my science or my claims in this video, please, please, please let me know in the comments below. I'm usually pretty good about responding. And in my attempts toward good science, I will not shake it off and pretend I was right all along. I will highlight any mistakes in the next video. And as always, please ask questions, especially to clarify any of the material I've covered. And don't forget to leave a like to motivate me to make the next one too. And follow me at the.amazing.labs on Instagram to see any updates. Check out my Patreon page, the link for which is in the description below. And feel free to contribute on there to get access to the STL files for my build videos. Also, you can buy my merch on my Spreadshirt shop, the link for which is in the description below. You can also find select items on my YouTube channel in the store tab. And let me just say, this is not even our best item. So, 
A quick reminder that the Patreon and the Spreadshirt shop both serve to support the creation of Dragline Dynamics, an independent laboratory where us inventors can begin to tackle the scientific problems I've outlined here, and maybe one day we'll be swinging with web fluid. Think Hacksmith Industries, but with more spider webs. Not like an abandoned Hacksmith Industries, but you get the idea. Also, the link to my Discord server is down below. Feel free to join and discuss to your scientific heart's content. I also host a podcast on Spotify with a member of the astrals if you don't know what that is just listen to the podcast the link is in the description um, just because something is impossible doesn't mean it will always be now stay safe stay amazing and i'll see you guys in the next one